Today I'm going to discuss COVID-19 in pregnant women. Pregnancy causes several physiologic changes, such as suppression of the immune system, edema of the respiratory tract mucosa, and increased oxygen consumption. Thus, historically, pregnancy increases the risk and severity of respiratory illnesses, such as SARS, MERS, and influenza. Published information from China, such as this paper published in The Lancet, a well-respected journal, suggests that pregnant women aren't more at risk for infection nor are they at risk for more symptoms when they are infected by COVID-19. It is important to note, however, that information is changing daily, as unfortunately more pregnant women are getting infected. The great news, despite what we have historically seen with other respiratory illnesses that cause severe disease in pregnant women due to their immunosuppressed system, the current data shows us that pregnant women with COVID-19 are still more likely to be asymptomatic or have mild illness and fully recover. Initially, AJOG, the American Journal of OBGYN, published guidelines for obstetricians that warned that pregnant women hospitalized with COVID-19 pneumonia may be at higher risk for being intubated and critically ill. AJOG then published a retrospective study on April 7, 2020, that concluded disease severity in the small cohort of pregnant patients showed that 86% of them were mild, 9.3% were severe, and 4.7% were critical. This appeared similar to what is described in the literature for non-pregnant people. That means for now, we are trying to treat pregnant women at home in isolation. In attempts to decrease exposure and infection risk, maternal fetal medicine experts have provided guidance for care in AJOG MFM, which is the American Journal of OBGYN MFM edition. One of these recommendations is to decrease in-person visits. Pregnant women typically see their OBGYN physician or midwife frequently throughout their pregnancy. The pandemic is changing those visits. For low-risk patients, the visits are more likely to be held via a drive through visit or even telemedicine. The visits are also more likely to be spaced out. In-person visits will occur if labs or ultrasounds are needed, as well as once the due date gets closer, which is typically the last three to four weeks. Physicians are also now instructing women to perform regular kit counts to continue to assess fetal movement. High-risk pregnancies, however, such as those with comorbidities like chronic hypertension, diabetes, cardiac disease, they will need to be seen more frequently and even require weekly antenatal testing. Like external fetal monitoring or ultrasounds, regardless if they are a PUI, a person under investigation, a COVID-19 positive patient, or not affected. Those whom are PUI or COVID-19 positive will have isolated rooms for that monitoring. If a patient becomes a PUI or a COVID-19 positive patient, then the recommendations are still the same for isolation as it is for those patients who aren't pregnant as long as they are stable. ACOG and SMFM, the American College of OBGYN and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, have created a nice algorithm of how to triage these patients on the phone to determine if they can isolate at home and treat their symptoms versus if they are sick enough that they need evaluation. As you probably know, the typical symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. However, a fair number of pregnant women are either asymptomatic or present with atypical symptoms including abdominal pain or vague, I'm just not feeling well complaints. Furthermore, some patients present to the hospital in labor for their planned induction or scheduled C-section, and it's not until after delivery that they begin showing typical symptoms, such as developing a fever. Unfortunately, the way they present is causing some confusion and delay in testing and diagnosis. Since patients may not develop symptoms until after delivery, physicians and nurses may think that the fever is coming from more typical postpartum causes. After giving birth, women can develop a fever from an infection such as endometritis, cellulitis, mastitis, or an infection of an incision. Some medications, such as those given to decrease postpartum hemorrhage, can also induce fever, as can atelectasis the small collapse of alveoli in your lung after a C-section, or any surgery for that matter. Assessing for any one of these common causes is necessary, however, certainly can delay diagnosis of COVID-19 and possibly expose more people to the virus in the meantime. The fact that a large percentage of pregnant women have mild symptoms or are asymptomatic is great news for pregnant women. Unfortunately, this is creating an environment where healthcare workers are now at significant risk for unknown exposure. The recent studies in AJOG have shown that up to 30% of these universally screened pregnant women are asymptomatic on presentation, but COVID-19 positive. 
these asymptomatic patients are still infectious and have now exposed all of those involved in their care. Because these findings are so significant, several institutions in the United States, including Columbia University in New York, are now universally screening all OB patients. Other institutions like Thomas Jefferson Memorial in Philadelphia have mandated that all obstetrical health care workers coming in direct contact with patients wear PPE, both in the outpatient and inpatient setting, inclusive of L&D. The second stage of labor when the mother begins pushing is a varied length of time. Coughing, spitting, vomiting are all common occurrences during this time. The patient's entire health care team is in the room, and they are then exposed to aerosolization of the virus if she has it. Thus, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, and SMFM, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, have advised that the team have full protective PPE, which includes gown, gloves, shoe covers, N95 mask, and shield for aerosolizing procedures. Unfortunately, due to PPE shortage across the United States, a lot of institutions are only allowing N95 masks for PUI or COVID-positive patients, and all others that are unaffected will have a surgical mask instead of an N95 mask. AJOG published early data on 43 known COVID-positive patients from two facilities in New York, one of which was Columbia. 14 out of 43, which is 32.6%, presented asymptomatically. Five of them developed a fever intrapartum during labor. Five developed symptoms postpartum, two which resulted in ICU admissions, and this resulted in 15 to 20 healthcare providers being exposed to the virus in each case. This is limited data based only on 43 cases. However, the two patients that required ICU admission had several other comorbidities as well as they both required C-sections that could have negatively impacted the severity of their infections. It's really too early to tell, but the authors felt compelled by the 32.6% to recommend PPE for all OB healthcare workers with patient care and universal COVID testing for all L&D patients that were admitted. COVID-19 also appears to affect laboratory values in pregnant patients. These laboratory changes include transaminitis, which are elevated liver function tests, also known as LFTs, and thrombocytopenia, which are low platelets, and are very similar to what we see in patients with preeclampsia that becomes severe and develops into HELP syndrome, which is hemolysis, elevated liver function tests, and low platelets. When a woman develops preeclampsia that evolves into HELP syndrome, this is a life-threatening emergency. The treatment is delivery, even if extremely premature. If a patient presents with these laboratory changes, but there is no indication that she has COVID-19, it may lead to the conclusion that the patient is preeclamptic and has developed HELP syndrome. This could significantly change the timing of delivery and could result in a physician deciding to advise a risky preterm delivery due to HELP versus just treating COVID-19 and possibly allowing the pregnancy to advance to term. It is important to note, however, at this time it is unknown if we could wait and allow COVID-19 to resolve in these situations. However, as we gain more knowledge, all of these details are prudent to excellent care of these patients. COVID-19 testing with a quick turnaround that provides rapid results will significantly help us with this confusion. It's crucial. It's important to recognize that even though a large majority of pregnant women will not have poor outcomes because of COVID-19, there are some that will. AJOG's systematic review and meta-analysis of COVID-19 positive pregnant patients, particularly those that are hospitalized with pneumonia, may have a higher risk of miscarriage, preterm labor, preeclampsia, and C-section, even though further studies from AJOG suggested that pregnant women may have similar distribution of disease severity to those that are non-pregnant, they did advise our findings may be interpreted with caution until more data become available, and there is reason to remain concerned for clinical course of COVID-19 in pregnant women. The final portion of care for women is referred to as the fourth trimester. This is referring to the postpartum period, and COVID-19 is significant in this trimester as well. In order to keep mothers and infants healthy, many hospitals are trying to expedite early discharge from the hospital after delivery. Many women that deliver vaginally normally would go home on postpartum day one or two. Now we are encouraging, when appropriate, that they go home on postpartum day one. Those women that have delivered by C-section typically go home on postpartum day two or three, and now, when appropriate, they are encouraged to go home on post-op day two. Even those that are PUI or COVID positive, if they only have mild symptoms and are stable, they are encouraged to go home as soon as medically appropriate for home isolation. 
To summarize, the current information confirms that pregnant women can get COVID-19. However, despite the physiologic changes in pregnancy, the majority of them seem to have mild disease similar to non-pregnant patients. The concerning thing is that they are at risk for miscarriage, preterm labor, and lab changes that can mimic pregnancy-related diseases such as HELP syndrome. In order to decrease the chance of pregnant patients getting infected, their OB visits are spaced out and have mostly become telehealth visits. They are encouraged to stay home to avoid becoming infected and, if stable with mild disease, remain in isolation like non-pregnant patients. Thank you for watching this video on COVID-19 and pregnancy. As mentioned previously, this information is changing rapidly, so please review literature frequently to stay current on guidance. Take care and stay safe.